to order. Lee Powers will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pete Miller will lead us in the invocation. If everyone please stand and remove your hats. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We ask that you be with us on our spiritual journey and remind us that the challenges that we face help us grow stronger in spirit. The good shepherd leaving the 99 in search of the one makes absolutely no sense unless the one that is lost is you. Having to endure the pain and suffering in life makes no sense at all unless you believe we are in service of a higher purpose. Sacrificing and being in service of others makes no sense unless you believe that we're all spiritually connected. Heavenly Father, we ask for the wisdom to see beyond this earthly world. In God's name we pray. Amen. Okay, brings us to item number three, citizens be heard. There are no citizens be heard at this time. No, Mayor. Brings us to item number four, council member comments. Conrad. Good to see everyone. Maggie. Thanks everyone for being here and, and have another great week before us. Pete? Yeah, just welcome to everybody and, and remember we had another shooting in the US, so uh, please remember those in your, in your thoughts and prayers. Lee? Thank you for attending. I like seeing people out there and I'll, uh, I'll remind you as I have in print, please avail yourself of our uh, little farmer's market here on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's growing, it's doing well, and we want to keep it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, one item, uh, just as a overall comment to the council members, uh, we did not include this year because it's a part of our annual calendar, the city manager performance and salary review that will take place in April. We'll be sending out information uh, very soon in order to have that information compiled and ready for us for a regular city council meeting in April. Sure. Brings us to item number five. Uh, I'm going to uh, acknowledge items number 5.1 and 5.3. Uh, item 5.1 is autism awareness program um, from the police department. Uh, Chief, would you like to make any comments about our recognition of autism as a, as a city of Shavano Park? Well, just I wanted to say, uh, I think it's been a long time coming that uh, we recognize autism, or April is Autism Awareness Month. And uh, uh, we've got some programs and so forth that we plan on doing next month. So uh, we hope to uh, have a good surprise for everybody. Okay, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, I'm gonna go now to 6.3. We have a proclamation for Arbor Day Earth Day. We're very excited about that. And uh, Maggie, what can you tell us about what we're gonna be doing this year for Arbor Day? Well, we're gonna be doing everything. We're gonna be planting trees. We're gonna be giving trees away. Probably people will sell us trees, anything to do with trees, plants. We're having some aroma tomatoes to sell from one of our organizations and, and some celebrity tomatoes and along with some herbs that will be sold. We have lots of things going on with the kids and posters and the, we have a uh, one of our big uh, uh, favorite arborists will be here and uh, he's gonna tell us all about what we wanna know about our trees that were frozen back this year and lost limbs. We have something for absolutely everyone so make sure you plan to stay all from 10 till one o'clock on Saturday. It's gonna be exciting and um, a magician is coming. I, did magician. you pull that out of your hat this year? Well, he came from somewhere. He came from <laughs> and somewhere. And we're gonna have hot dogs. And we're going to have hot dogs. We're really excited about that. And, and the Blackman Elementary School, I hope is gonna be very excited. We're again, go again going to be graced by Whataburger with three Whataburger for a year baskets. And so it, you, know, you don't All have right. to hit the half court shot at the Spurs game in order to get a Whataburger basket. You just have to be a good artist at Blackman. God bless those little kids. <laughs> okay, this brings us to item number 5.3, uh, introduction of the Fiesta metal design. Uh, yes. 
There, there is an illustration of what our Fiesta Metal design is, and, and I'm going to ask Ruth and her family to come forward so that we can all give them a round of applause oh, and take some indeed. pictures. Come on up. Come on up. While the mayor is coming up here and, and I have the microphone, I want to say that's absolutely one of the funniest, best medals ever. Thank you so much. This will go down in history. It is. It will be my all-time favorite. And thank you for thinking it up. <laughs> it's very appropriate. <laughs> we need some potholes in there somewhere. <laughs> no potholes when we finish these roads. That, that's our theme. No, that, the that will be a new motto for Shavano Park. <laughs> right. No potholes. No potholes. Uh, country living with city, uh, city living with country charm, uh, and no potholes. And no potholes. A new modification. We'll okay, brings us to item 6.1, discussion action. Approval phase one, road construction east, based on bids received from request, uh, from request for proposal. Bill, Chris, Chris, are you going to start us off, or Bill going to start us off? Well, I'll just say that it's been a year uh, in planning and development, and uh, we very deliberately went through this. And I'll turn it over to Chris just by saying that we went out for a request for proposals on the uh, 3rd of February. Over to Chris. All right, so as I told you all at the last meeting, um, we'd be coming back today with a recommendation to award the construction contract for the phase one uh, street maintenance. Um, slide um so D, D contractors was the low bidder um i'll get more into that in a moment we're going to discuss cps and their plans for this project um and i did want to let y'all know that um terracon um we are going to be contracting with to do quality assurance uh construction materials testing um during construction and so we're still working on getting a proposal from them on that um, but we should have a cost for that um, by the end of this week um, next slide. So these are the bids that we received. Um, there were six different contractors. Um, as I mentioned, D&D was the low bidder. Um, the Chavano portion of the work was the base bid, Adult 1, Adult 2, and Adult 3. Um, adult 4 was for CPS to replace the gas um, services throughout the project area. Um, so D&D came in at 6 $282 million, um, and we are recommending the award of the contract to them. Um, adult four came in very high. Um, CPS was expecting a number significantly lower than that, and you can see across the board, all of the contractors were very high on the CPS work. Um, they didn't understand why. And so what CPS has decided to do is they're not going to construct Adult 4 as part of our joint bid. Instead, they are going to do that under a separate contract in advance of us doing the road work. Um, and from what I understand, they've already contracted with Miller Brothers, and they were beginning work 
this week, I believe. And we do have Dee and Bill Fay on the Zoom call if they want to add to that. Yes, yeah, so we had a pre-construction meeting today with Miller Brothers and um, they would like to start this week. Uh, we just got to get the permits done. Uh, Miller Brothers said that they're on top of that, so they should have that turned in hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, we estimate the project will take about four months. Uh, and I, from what I understand, I believe the road work's going to start in June, so we should be well ahead of them um, by the time they start the reconstruction project. And just to amplify that, uh, we met, we were at the pre-construction meeting, Brandon and I were there. Uh, CPS was well represented, but also was Miller Brothers. And I think they had six or seven of their supervisors and foremen, they had their super, you know, their folks there. They have been in our city for the last two weeks looking at the, uh, the problems and, the, and they've actually started on wagon trail giving uh, door hangers and starting to let people know that they're getting ready to get started. And so uh, um, I believe they will start this week and then they're gonna move forward. We're gonna permit it uh, three at a time and then um, make adjustments as we go, two or three at a time. We'll, we'll work through that with Miller Brothers. But they were, they were I, I was impressed with their approach, their, uh, their commitment and the team that they had assembled in preparation for this. And they're gonna move on, they're gonna move quickly. Uh, one thing we talked about, if there was some reason there was gonna be they, they ran into unanticipated problems that they could stay ahead of our road construction by only doing the long services across the road and keep and moving that from and then coming back and then doing the short services that, that don't interfere with the road at all later. Not preferable because they want to do, they want to knock out one, one road at a time, but, but if you had to, you, they could do that. Additionally, I would just add that we're focusing in on the roadways that uh, y'all schedule is starting initially. And so we'll, we'll be able to be completed with roadways to allow them sufficient time to uh, uh, have a lot of buffer in their schedule between our work and, and y'all's work. Okay, anything else, Chris? Uh, no, so, I mean, Based on the conversations we've had with CPS, I'm, I'm not concerned. Um, their work will be well ahead of us, so I don't expect any delays with that. Um, go ahead and skip to the next one, Curtis. Okay, so this was a qualifications-based um, low bid. They had to have meet certain qualifications, which was three projects in the last five years, over a million dollars in a residential area, established residential area. Um, they have numerous projects. The three that kind of jumped out at me are Cibolo Valley Drive Street Reconstruction and Cibolo. Um, D&D is currently working on this. It's not in a residential neighborhood, but it's immediately adjacent to a residential neighborhood. Um, there is significant traffic on this street and a charter school um, in the construction area. And I don't know if you all I am the city engineer in Cibolo. Um, they've been doing a very good job on that coordinating traffic and everything else. Um, also, Tim Foose with the city of Chavano could not say enough good things about D&D &D on, on that project. The same is true for the South Main Street reconstruction and traffic signals. Um, again, that's not necessarily a residential per se. It is, there are residential homes along that. It's more of a, a business area. Um, which when it comes to construction is even more challenging than residential because you have to maintain access or there's financial impacts to those businesses. Um, and then the other one was the city of Pleasanton, Colony Drive, Massad, and Live Oak Road. Um, that is very close to Chavano Park um, as far as the environment that they were working in. Um, and we do have the contractor here if you'd like to ask them any additional questions. Um, but with that said, they did meet our qualifications. They are the low bid, and I am asking city council, or I am recommending that city council award the construction contract to D and D contractors. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Do you have anything else that you'd like to? Yeah, I, I, let's bring Kelly up here, the, uh, the the owner of D and D here. Good evening. Thanks Good for evening. thanks for allowing me to be here. 
So you want me to just talk or you want to ask questions? So <clears throat> give you a little history on me. I started self-employment in 91. I incorporated June 5th of 1995. So in June, I'll celebrate 28 years of self-employment. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. And to kind of add to some of the projects that he'd done, I think that this is kind of our niche in construction is the reconstruct portion. So for the city of Live Oak in 2017, we did 20 streets for them um, in several different residential neighborhoods with the city of Live Oak. Um, and all of those, instead of having a house every acre, we had a house every 45 feet. And we had full depth reconstruction on all those. So we learned a lot on all that stuff. So we would like to take the things that we've learned over the last few years and what we've done is we've been able to mitigate the inconvenience to the homeowner because a street in front of your house is a pain in the butt. So we've implemented a lot of things for communication, letting the homeowners know what's going on, when it's happening. One of the projects we had for the city of Live Oak was we had to rip out all the streets and replace it with concrete paving. To do that, we were, only, we were only given 400 foot sections at a time, but we had a seven day cure per period and then a 15 day construction period. So for approximately 21 days, homeowners couldn't get to their houses. So we implemented group texting and we even had shuttle service where we help people get to and from their homes. Um, some of the things we do to mitigate a lot of the issues, a lot of times you find construction gets started and then it's like, where did the contractor go? Well, typically what we have found was when situations like that arise, the contractor does not, the contractor wants to be on site every day. But we run into things that engineering and old things that you didn't know were there, we find them once we start excavation or start construction. So what we've done is we've changed the way that we do business. So we, we, we qualify the site before we ever get started. We do potholing, we check, um, for any types of conflicts so that all conflicts are addressed ahead of time before we get on site. That way when we rip a street up, it's gonna get put back. We have verified that there are no conflicts to the best of our abilities. We do that, we've even changed from, we still use the old door hanger, but that door hanger now is a little bit more advanced. It has a QR code. So any uh, resident that gets a door hanger, they can click that QR code takes them straight to our Chavano Park portion of our website, and then it'll direct them on what's going on, when it's to be happening. The construction gets schedule gets changed at minimum once a week. And there's also cell phone numbers to the people involved with that project where they're not calling you guys or calling any city officials. My guys get called first to handle anything. If we're gonna have a section of street excavated, we've checked the weather to make sure that we don't have inclement weather coming, we don't rip it up, and then all of a sudden it's raining. And we also have aggregate set aside that if that does happen, our crews are putting materials down to where we have two wheel drive passable streets during inclement weather. So I think in the 28 years that we've been doing this, soon to be 28 years, I think we've mitigated to the best of our abilities and we've actually performed our trade to the best of our abilities. So as technology changes, we're changing with it. Um, website's real good, the group text messaging works great, but the best motivation is my guys have to give up their cell phone numbers to the residents. Well, so I, I, I'm sure that some of our council members would like to give up their cell phone numbers as well. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would save Bill getting those telephone calls. So with that, I appreciate your consideration for our award. We, we would be honored to work for you guys and implement what we've learned over the last 28 years to make your streets what we want them to be. Thank you very much, Keller. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I do want to amend my recommendation. I did not state it properly. I recommend awarding the base bid, added a vault number one, added a vault number two, and added a vault number three for a total of $6,282,548.69 to D&D contractors. Okay. Um, Bill, do you have anything else? Nothing further. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve D&D contractors for award of a base bid with alternatives number one, number two, number three, and authorize the city manager to negotiate construction contract of $6,282,548 and 69 cents for Chavano Park Street Maintenance Phase 
um, 1A. Do we have a motion? So, so moved. moved. We have a motion from Pete. We have a second from Maggie. We're now open for discussion. Is there any discussion? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Kelly, congratulations. <coughs> we look forward to working with you. Chris, thank you very much. Okay, uh, item number two. Uh, discussion, phase one, De Zavala planning update. Chris. Go ahead and next slide. All right, De Zavala, we have submitted the revised 60% plans um, based on comments we received from council several months ago. Um, with that, we did add uh, four feet of impervious cover for the sidewalks, and we're also adding a curb um, to elevate the sidewalks. Um, and we also added the, the bike lane buffers to provide some separation from the bike lanes and the, the travel lanes. Next slide. Um, so the revised 60% plans have been submitted. Um, our current cost estimate is $2.969 million. The previous cost estimate uh, was $1.9 million. Um, so there was an increase. Um, that's due to the additional pavement, uh, the curbs, um, and then also the shaving of the hill to um, correct the intersection site distance at bikeway. Next slide. Uh, there is a CPS gas crossing near Almost Creek. Um, it is in conflict with the proposed gas. CPS has been notified and they have agreed to um, adjust that gas line so that it's not in conflict. And because it is within y'all's right of way, CPS will be doing that adjustment at their expense and no expense to the city. Uh, next steps, the WPAP has been prepared and was submitted um, in March. Um, we're expecting approval of that any day now. Um, the revised 60s were submitted March 17th. 90% will be complete in uh, mid-May, the 19th. Uh, and we're expecting to have a town hall in June and have the 100% plans completed in July, um, the end of July this year. Any questions on Days okay. of Allah? Bill, do you have anything that you'd like to add concerning Days of Allah? Um, not at this time. Okay. I think we're good. Any questions, comments, concerns from council? Lee? It didn't occur to me till I saw what uh, TxDOT is doing out here on military, putting in those little uh, back curves for bus stops. Is that going to be an issue on Days of Allah? Any bus stops? Just the one down yeah, at Lock Hill, then. Correct. Yeah. Well, what I think, uh, there, there, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Conrad. Uh, remind me again about the um, improvement portion that gets us in this uh, WPAP that. It's uh, the impervious cover aspect. I'm, I'm probably using the wrong word there, but there's a, a percentage that is key that we maintain or improve. Right. So we we added four feet of pavement, um, which requires uh, treatment. Um, all of the existing impervious cover was grandfathered because it was built before those ordinances or ordinances went into effect. But that additional four feet is two feet on either side that we have to treat. Um, and we're just doing that through a vegetated filter strip. And so basically the grass behind the sidewalk can be used to treat that water. Um, so it doesn't really add any cost to the project. It's just the TCEQ process that we have to go through to get it approved. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, there are no more questions or comments. We'll go on to item 6.3. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Item number 6.3, discussion, presentation discussions, Chavano Park Commercial and Residential Development semi-annual presentation. I understand Daryl's gonna be joining us. Thank you, Bobby. I understand Daryl's gonna be joining us remotely. 
That is correct, Mayor. Yes, sir. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mayor and uh, members of City Council. It's Daryl Lang with Bitter Blue. Good evening. Are we going to be able to pull him up on the video? Uh, Daryl, you just talking to us, or do you have a video for us? I'm I am just talking. I am out of town, so okay. I'm just talking. If that's okay. No, that's great. There, great. You, sh Thank you should you. be able to and see your I, slides now, Daryl. And I know, perfect. I know you, Mr. Denton, sends his regards. He's sorry he could not make it to this evening, and I will try to keep this short and sweet with you know items. I know you have a packed agenda. Uh, moving right in with the residential side of things, I'm going to focus on the notes. Huntington Unit 5, the last unit, is complete. And in Pond Hill Unit number 1, garden homes are all sold. So that project is basically completed in Unit number 1. In Pond Hill Unit number 2, 12 homes are sold. And average sold price in Unit 2 is 675000 Unit two landscape and gates will be completed this spring. And then all planned residential development in Chavano Park is uh, trending towards being complete here very soon. Um, let's go to the next slide, Curtis, if you don't mind. Uh, that shows the last slide of Huntington Estates, unit five. Uh, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, that's the, the visual representation there of the, the last unit. And these are the selected subdivision plats of Huntington Unit 5. There. Uh, that's the completed villas, Unit 1. Everything's done there. And the next slide, um, this shows an aerial from December of 22 of the ingress, egress, the drive and some of the selected lots that have been built there in Pond Hill Villas, you know, phase two. I know I kind of went quick there, but any questions on either Huntington or Pond Hill, you know, garden villas that if I don't have the answer, I can get the answer and relay back to everybody. Okay, uh, let's go on and talk about some commercial. Sure, we'll move on. Perfect, uh, right there. This probably has the most activity. Now I understand that this is out of Chavano Park, but it borders Chavano Park. And so we have a lot of activity here. Uh, the car wash is closed at Days of Vala and Indian Woods. We have a QSR pad under contract next to the car wash. And there is quite a bit of uh, work being done, development work there where Indian Woods meets Lock Hill Selma and that's for stormwater detention uh, there that services all of this area. So you see a lot of activity going on in this area and that, that's what's happening. You know, there, there's a lot of activity, both closings and pending closings and infrastructure development with stormwater and drainage okay. there. Uh, Daryl, uh, the pre-planning commercial office along Lock Hill Selma behind the Walmart, how much of that water is going to spill over into Chavano Creek? Well, from what I understand, you know, it will be, it has been designed for ultimate development for the rest of the acreage that will be eventually developed. And that will go into the detention and then metered out the flow that goes under Lock Hill Selma all approved through the city of San Antonio stormwater. And I can get more details if needed, but it, that's why yeah. that area is so large there is because it's taking all the ultimate development and making sure that it's held there and then release controlled release under that culvert under Lock Hill Selma. Bill, do you want to add anything at this time? Well, I, I got that same request from Chavano Creek for uh for uh, an inquiry, I sent that to Laddie, and then that's what he basically got the engineers together and said, that's why it's so big. And so what they used to just have was just an eroded uh, ravine in there where it just all funneled in there. 
uh, now that area is being expanded greatly and uh, they haven't finished the detention part of that, but the concept is to detain it and then to allow it to flow. And um, I think it's engineered by, okay. by Pete uh, Delson. Yeah, Darrell, one of the things we've been working with San Antonio concerning is having sidewalks on both sides of Lock Hill Soma from Hebner all the way to 1604. Uh, are y'all going to be introducing sidewalks through that entire property from the basis all the way back to CBS and, and Earl Cobb? I, I know definitely from Indian Woods up to Days of Olive, those will be required by City of San Antonio. Now, why, and I'm looking at this exact same aerial, why there's not a sidewalk in front of basis along Lock Hill Selma, or maybe there is, I just can't see it, but that whole area will have sidewalks. Okay because they will be mandated by the city of San Antonio. Okay, uh, next. Uh, this is 2.2 acres. Um, we're, we're working with engineers on how to solve the drainage and topography of this. These are just draft exhibits, um, but we are putting some attention on that. And at our next update, I'm sure we'll have some more information for you. And moving on here, Curtis, you're doing a great job at speed. Uh, this is a great, uh, this is a very good aerial of the phase two Pond Hill Garden Villas. And that shows you a different perspective there for Pond Hill Garden Villas phase two. And the future commercial, we'll just continue to work on that on the frontage. We have Soul Fitness, Polished Nails, Park Hill Dental, Merit Coffee. We're going to be doing some improvements there in the parking lot. Uh, it's getting a lot of debris from the construction there. And we're going to be restriping and re, uh, basically it's called top coating the asphalt there once majority of the construction is done because it needs, a, it needs some maintenance there and it'll be better, more user friendly for customers. Uh, here, not a lot of change on this corner. Um, we are trying to get some direction from both generations on, and Bill Miller on when they might construct, uh, but for right now, we have the 4.45 acres and the two acres there on Pond Hill. Continue to pre-plan in this area on the 22 acres, um, challenging, a bit of a challenging economic environment right now with interest rates and construction costs. So we're, we're taking it day by day in this area. We're not gonna rush into anything and it's going to be a thoughtfully designed development, even if it takes us a few additional years here. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, okay. And then just moving on, Huntington Commercial, we have some vacancy there, and we're working to address that vacancy. We have the 2.52 acres there, Seasons Memory Care, Purchase Bader House, that's a new development. And so that has a new owner operator there in Seasons Memory Care. Hey, Daryl, on the vacancy, is that the existing vacancy that's been since the building was constructed, or is that a new um, vacancy from a previous resident uh, occupant? No, it's existing vacancy. And what we're focused on is finishing out the 3,000 square feet on the first floor and just getting it done on the 3,000. And then maybe waiting on the 4,800 on the second floor with the way the office market is. We, we think we can get a 3,000 square foot user on that first floor. We might not take the exposure on finishing the second floor at this point. Napier Park, uh, we have the frontage. Uh, we're putting up new signage, a second sign on the frontage, and we have you know, tracks A, B, and C on the frontage. And uh, same thing here, we're gonna be thoughtful about how that gets developed here for the remaining portion of Napier Park. And Curtis, thank you for all your help on uh, with the sign permit there. Thank you very much. On Ridgeline, again, we understand that this is out of Chavano Park, but we want you to see what's going on you know, along your borders. Uh, Carolina Rogers Ranch is probably 30, 35% complete vertical structure going up. 
and we're planning the remaining 22, 23 acres to the west. Uh, multifamily right now, again, is has its headwinds, again, with interest rates and construction costs there. Okay. And that's the that's the end of the commercial tour. I, I know we ran through a quick. Uh, do you all have any questions that I could answer or get you additional information on? Any questions, comments, concerns? Darrell, looks like uh, we're all fine here. Want to thank you for your presentation, buddy. Good to see you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. It brings us to item number 6.4, Discussion Action Ordinance O-2023-003 of the City of Shepno Park, Texas. Ordinances regulating junk vehicles within the city, providing for penalties, providing for a cumulative and conflicts clause, providing for a severability clause, and providing for an effective date, possible executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551071, consultation with attorney. This is our final reading. Uh, Bill, uh, we talked about this in our last council meeting, and <clears throat> we had a couple of different issues that were on the table still. Uh, one of them that we had talked about was, uh, would we want to have, who would we want to have as the regulatory board? And the consensus seemed to be that formed at the very end was the Board of Adjustments, and it would be titled uh, styled under a different name, just like the city council is the crime control district. It would, we, they would just wear a separate hat. So there was one other issue that we were talking about. And Bill, do you have a recommendation for us on that final item? Yeah, the other thing we did was we struck uh, morals from the public uh, uh, whereas clauses. And just to rehash a little bit, this is the second reading. We went over this pretty extensively in the first reading. And we're here because um, Texas Transportation Code allows the city to declare certain vehicles meeting the definition of a junk vehicle to be a public nuisance and abate them in accordance with the law. But you have to have established ordinances to do that, and we had not established that. Most of the cities around us have these kinds of laws. It's just something that we hadn't got around to. So again, Texas Transportation Code explicitly defines these, these vehicles and allows for cities to abate for it. It doesn't establish the procedures for a city to do it, and that's what we're doing here is we're establishing that. Um, and then to the core of this question um, of, of how we define uh, junk vehicles is this, this Texas Transportation Code authorizes a governing body of a municipality to provide for a more inclusive definition of a junk vehicle subject to the regulation of the Texas Transportation Code. That's very, very important, which says that we can pass a law that defines the junk vehicle differently than the state as long as we follow the state's law. So uh, we've got, you've asked us to come up with two versions, version one and version two. Version one is what we passed last time. That's gonna be what the staff recommendation is because we believe it's clear in terms of, of, of not being very clear in the definition and not having it uh, to be read and implied in, in, the, in the exclusion. So I've got a couple slides associated with that to uh, show you real quick. Uh, version one, and there you have two versions in your ordinances. Version one basically says a junk vehicle means it's self-propelled and that's either a you know, boat or an airplane or a, a, a vehicle. We typically have boats and vehicles in Shavano Park. Um, and that it's wrecked, dismantled, or partially dismantled, disc discarded, or inoperable. And inoperable for in a public place for 72 hours in a private location for 30 consecutive days. Um, in our definition here, that we passed last time a voter vehicle that displays an expired license plate or does not display a license plate um, is a junk vehicle. And we have um, redefined the definition or refined it, refined it to say that an inoperable vehicle with specially licensed plates, which is not used solely as intended for exhibits uh, club activities, parades, other functions of public interest as defined by the Texas Transportation Code 
is also a, a junk vehicle. Item number, uh, option number two, removes that portion of the definition and puts it instead in, a, in, in the ex exemptions. The difference between this yellow definition and the, uh, the, the one in, in the definition is, in the definition of a junk vehicle, it says it's not being used for its intended purposes. This says you can't regulate it if it is being used for the intended purposes. We think that nuance is, is very complex. It's harder to read. It's, a lot, it's stated a lot clearer if you just put it in the definition. And so that is, that's, the, uh, that's the recommendation that we have. And we don't believe there's any other differences or areas of confusion in the ordinance. Dan and I have talked about this. Uh, can you go back to uh, version one? The question is, if we determine something is um, a junk vehicle, and for example, if it had an antique license plate, but it was in op, there is a process of due pro there is a due process um, um, that we have st set up by creating a junk vehicles appeals board. Somebody that has been declared a vehicle that's been declared a junk vehicle can appeal that. It goes before the board of appeals, the junk board of appeals, which in this case is the sitting members of the board of adjustment will have to appoint that in the next uh, in the policy. The policy does that later on, another agenda item. But uh, then the city would just similar to a variance would present its case. The citizen would present his case, and the and then that board of appeals for junk vehicles would would make the determination. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, anything else? Nothing further. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve version one of ordinance O 2023-003 of the city of Chavano Park, Texas, regulating junk vehicles within the city, providing for penalties, providing for cumulative and conflict causes, providing for severability clause, and providing for an effective date? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Maggie and a second from Conrad. We're now open for discussion. Lee. Just uh, for the record and to establish the scope of the need for this thing, could you give us two perhaps items, uh, total number of vehicles that you are aware of personally that necessitates this uh, within the city limits of Chavano Park? Yeah, there's uh, five that we've been investigating in uh, five different residents on, tur on uh, Wagon Trail. I've had some complaints. Um, from folks in Turkey Creek and some other places that, that we suspect that there are numerous uh, numerous situations. Now, you can have junk vehicles if it's like you put it in your garage. There's lots of junk vehicles in the uh, in the, uh, the city. The question is becomes a nuisance when it's visible from public view or from or from the public right away, and that's the issue. Exactly. I just want to make it part of the record that this is not a single isolated address or vehicle in question, it is uh, a bit more pervasive than that. Okay. Conrad. The um, inoperable, is that defined by us or that of the state? Uh, we define it in, our, in this ordinance. So to, to read through that, the definition of an inoperable vehicle means a vehicle that is in such condition at a time of inspection that is no longer usable for the purpose in which it's manufactured regarding regardless of the potential for repair or restoration. If the vehicle's wrecked, dismounted, or dismantled, or partially dismounted, dismount, it's presumed to be inoperable. So that, uh, we, we researched that very carefully, ran that through the attorneys and it's that been tested and that's good for us. I'd like to remind, I think this is a, the certification is canceled if this is declared junk and taken in, off the property. Uh, if the landowner does not remove the property before it is finally certified, it will be destroyed. Okay. Yeah. Pete. So my, my question is to Dan. Dan, there, there's a subtle difference between version one and two. Are you comfortable with version one? Does it achieve the same objective as both of them? And what, what are the pros and cons? Yes, sir. Uh, it does. It, it really was more nuanced discussion 
between me and, and Bill and, and, and your prosecutor with regard to burden of proof and how that would be how that would be accomplished. But I'm I'm perfectly fine with it the way Bill has it worded. It just shifts that a little bit, but that's that's really for us to deal with and and uh, and the fact that it, it that there's a an appeal to a board of appeals. I'm I'm not concerned that due process is not preserved. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Conrad. Sorry about. Uh, maybe Chief Fox could discuss this, but uh, the actual implementation of this. Um, we have some experience with this, or do you have experience with this, or know how that has been dealt with functionally? Well, we haven't had any experience with it here in Chavano Park. Um, <clears throat> so we have some situations right now that are going through the court process, um, but we haven't gotten to this level. So in Chavano Park, we've been dealing with in-op vehicles. Correct. And then this allows us to, the well, state allows us to declare it junk vehicle, but we don't have any procedures to deal with it once it's designated. Yeah. I just, I'm wondering if Chief Fox had had some familiarity with this or... or and done this in the past. Not, not in the past, no. So just working on what that process might be, if there's something out there that you can get some experience with or not training, I guess. Well, we <laughs> I think don't. it's similar to the like a variance. You know, if someone has got a a, a code violation and it's already built, or if they submit plans and it's denied, then uh, they can apply for a variance. And a lot of the uh, the actions of, of a junk vehicle board is going to be very similar. Public hearings, public notice, uh, and we've got it set up to where there's presentations on both sides. There is a, a neutral party that hears it. They make a determination based upon the law. The attorney would be there, you know, et cetera. It wouldn't be going into, it would not be done in the municipal court of law. It would be done in a separate hearing. Okay. Pete? So, Bill, I just I want to confirm th this isn't an outlier. Most cities have something uh, like this, right? Yeah. Th this, what we're trying to do is just shore up what we've got to make yeah. it more clear. Is that correct? Texas law allows us to do it. They allow you to abate it, but you have to adopt rules to be able to abate it. I don't have the exact percentage of what number of cities do or not, but uh, certainly most larger cities have th have these rules. Okay. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, comments, or concerns, um, all in favor of approving version one of ordinance O-2023-003 of the city of Chavano Park, Texas, regulating junked vehicles within the city, providing for penalties, providing for cumulative and conflicts clause, providing for a severability clause, and providing for an effective date, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries 5-0. Item number 6.5, Discussion Action Ordinance O-2023-004, amending Chapter 4, Animals to Adopt the Procedures to Safely and Humanely Regulate Dangerous, Aggressive, and Public Nuisance Dogs. Bill, Chief? Bill, do you want to start it yeah, while the Chief's coming start up? It. I'll start it. Uh, Texas Health and Safety Code delegates responsibility of animal control to municipalities. We don't have a very robust ordinance on animal control. We have an animal control officer. We have a regulation that pr um, prohibits um, dogs from being, you know, from, from being running loose, et cetera, but we haven't established procedures to be able to deal with that. Texas is very similar to uh, junk vehicles. Texas has laws that designate and define what a dangerous dog is, but we're we're authorized to expand on that, which this ordinance does. And I'll I'll turn it over to Chief, and he can kind of get into the each. Um, he did the majority of the work in preparing for this. Did a great job of that, and we've run this through the attorney as well. So, like the city manager said, um, right now our city ordinance regarding animals has three things in it. Basically talks about responsibilities, um, dogs running at large, and uh, uh, who's able to enforce them. So 
what we did was we were I was asked to do a, a dangerous dog ordinance after seeing what happened um, in the city of San Antonio and so forth and some issues that we had here locally and we compiled numerous uh, numerous ordinances from other towns and so forth most everybody has a dangerous dog ordinance of some type um, what I found was in San Antonio who surrounds us they have both a dangerous dog and an aggressive dog ordinance and definition uh, what I found with the city of Houston was not only do they have those two but they also expand with a public nuisance dog so it kind of breaks it down a little bit more so than the state definition of a dangerous dog um, which is one-sided and uh, this proposed policy kind of gives us a little bit more flexibility in how to deal with different animal situations that we dealt with. Um, so we basically expanded on the city of uh, Houston's, uh, went through the city of San Antonio's. Um, I looked up uh, probably about 12 different ordinances um, with other municipalities, kind of took and choose from some of those and compiled it all into one. Um, so I think we have a pretty extensive uh, ordinance right now um, proposed to you all. So. Okay, thank you very much. Bill? Again, this is, this is really pretty nice because it allows us to, uh, to work through this. And the, the nuisance dog, I'll just kind of read the definition. Dogs that run at large th three or more times in one year or other activities that interferes with the right of enjoyment of life, property, and persons other than the owner. So, you know, that's doesn't reach to the level of aggressive dog, but with with the complaints that we have, and we literally have complaints all over the city every week. And you have uh, situations where you have an owner that has a dog and they barks and does these things and gets loose, and we would able we would be able to then declare it a public nuisance dog, and you know and and cite them for that, you, you know. When you get to what it takes to be a dangerous dog, there's very specific uh, state laws that talk about that. We're just remaining consistent with that, but uh, that's where you really get into where the city has a lot of teeth to be able to affect change. The other ones are pretty much um, ordinances that you, you find them with, they have to come to court, and then we work through all that. But uh, we find that with these owners that get cited with the dogs, they really want to be good neighbors, and they try to conform and, and, and work through this. So I think this will have a positive um, effect on our ability to govern and protect our residents. Because this is really about protecting our residents. Pre Making sure we don't have a situation that happened in San Antonio where pe dogs got out, they were d deemed dangerous, and then they kill somebody. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, we have a motion before us, or we do not have a motion before us. Do we have a motion to approve Ordinance O-2023-004, amending Chapter 4, Animals, to adopt procedures to safely and humanely regulate dangerous, aggressive, and public nuisance dogs? This is a first reading. So moved. We have a motion from Maggie. We have a second from Lee. We're now open for discussion. I have a question. Maggie? Uh, where do loose dogs fit in? Like your dog, somebody leaves the gate open and your puppy runs out and he's loose and he's picked up. Hopefully in return he's properly. Well, that still falls under our animals running at large okay. ordinance and so forth. So in order to get a public nuisance de declaration out of that, it has to be three or more three. times within a calendar year, a 12, cal month, or a 12 month period, let me rephrase that. Okay, three or more so times in a calendar year. In a, okay. in yes, and so, in a 12 month So period. this same puppy, this same gate gets left open, and he gets out four times. Where, where does he fall? Is he falling the nuisance or the <laughs> <laughs> wildest? We're, we're here to work with the residents and so forth. Okay, so usually There's usually types, considerations. There's people working and, for them. Right, and we have to take each one of these incidents one by one. And, uh, and look at that based on the facts and so forth. Um, so if it's a puppy getting out, you know, maybe we work with that resident. Um, if they're actively searching for it, it's no fault of their own. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be declared a public nuisance dog, no. 
So we've got we got leeway. There, yeah. There's there's room in there, and the way you know we distinguish this with dangerous dogs, aggressive dogs, and public nuisance dogs, it gives the officers the ability to kind of use that leeway in their decision making process when they do their reports and so forth. Um, or if a resident does complain, file a complaint against uh, a dog as being one of the three and allows us to look at that. One of the easiest ways to, rem to distinguish a dangerous versus aggressive dog, and it's not all inclusive, but is to think of a dangerous dog, an act that occurs outside of the property that that dog belongs to, on a street, across the street, down the street, so forth. Whereas an aggressive dog, a lot of it not inclusive, pertains to what happens on that dog owner's property, whether it be in the enclosure or in the gates, um, or the gates are open, but they're on their properties. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Pete. So I, I think this is a good idea, and I think it's a good idea to add the public nuisance dog, but quick question. I, I, when I read through this, I understood the dogs running at large three or more times so within a year. What are other activities? What, is, what does that cover? <laughs> Anything that's not listed. Pretty much. <laughs> well, uh, you, you could have an aggressive dog. That, yeah. No, but that, know, that goes under the aggressive dog. So this is the public nuisance dog. So a public nuisance dog is a dog that's out running at large three times. You get caught three times. It's kind of the three-strike policy here. <laughs> but, and I get that. I get that. I just didn't know what the other activities Other were. activities that interfere with the right of enjoyment of life and property by persons other right. than the owner. What, what does that, that dog mean? is it barking nonstop for yeah. three oh, weeks straight. So that includes a barking dog as a nuisance dog? There's already a, a, a barking ordinance for noise. But this is just elevates it a little bit. They can be cited for barking okay. dog. They can be cited for it got loose, and it can be a public nuisance. Okay. Does does this apply to gated communities as well? <laughs> <laughs> it applies. It applies everywhere that's in Shavano Park. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you. Do you have one of those? <laughs> or are you looking to get one? <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, if there aren't any more questions. Oh, okay, Lee, sorry. Chief, I've never asked, but does the department have a chip reader? Yes, we do. We have several chip readers. And, and you maintain a log, <laughs> of course, of anything that's ever come across, the necessity to do a chip reader Well, on a dog. anytime we end up doing that, the uh, officers are doing a report anyway okay. for city of ordinance violations, so all that information is included in there. And then when we take them over to, uh, if we can't find the owner um, with the chip, we can't talk to them or speak to them, we take them to the vet clinic that we're contracted with on Lock Hill. And uh, they maintain also a log of who comes and picks them up um, and when, and that log is shared with us at the end of every month as part is of the contract. Is that information shown on the city's webpage? I, I've never mm -hmm. looked. As far as the logs? No, for a citizen to be aware that this is a well, well, how to find a the dogs? I would sure. prefer to call this a service rather than something, yeah. you know, going after people's dogs. This is, this is a good thing. I would like to look at it from the, the I've seen side. it on the uh, web page before how to I can't I haven't looked at it in the last um, year or so yeah. I don't think it's, it's fallen off but it's, we it's, can double check yeah okay. great thank you okay I'm pretty sure we've been doing a pretty good job about getting uh, animals reassociated with uh, their owners through our veterinary process <laughs> when he gets that yapping dog okay okay <laughs> Um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, there being no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Uh, Pete has asked me to recognize him. Yeah, Mayor, I'd, I'd like to do a point of order. Uh, so I'd like to go back to item 6.1. And put it back on the table? I'd like to put it back on the table. I don't think uh, I heard everybody's vote on that. Okay. And I think Buddy just, uh, I don't know if, if I just didn't hear him or... Uh, if he wasn't on there, but I think it's I think that's a critical item and I think we need to make sure that the buddy has the opportunity to vote Okay, if he, uh, uh, if he has we've we have, have had a motion from Pete second from Maggie uh, Buddy <clears throat> on a motion to approve D&D &D contractors for award of base bid with alternatives number one number two and number three and authorize the city manager to negotiate construction contract for six million two hundred and eighty two thousand five hundred forty eight dollars and sixty nine cents for the City of Chavano Park City Maintenance Plan Phase 1. Uh, there being no objection, we're going to put this back on the table. There being no objection, uh, I will now call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The motion carries 5 0. We'll now return to the normal order of business, item 6.6 Federal Micro Purchase Resolution. Discussion action resolution R 2023 007 authorizing increase in micro purchase threshold for purchases of goods and services using federal funding subject to the procurement standards of two uh, CFR part 200 subpart D uh, bill I'll recognize you and our wonderful finance director. Yeah, so we're working with Bear County to figure out a means and what projects are appropriate for the use of the funds that they've allocated, the federal funds that they've allocated to help offset the waterline relocation. And as I've kind of mentioned to you before, they would prefer if we had one $750,000 project where we formally bid it out and we were able to make sure very cleanly that we followed the federal um, contracting regulations. We've studied this extensively. Brenda, Curtis, and I worked through our attorney on this, and we've explained to Bear County that, you know, we don't have a $750,000 project just sitting there. What we have is a lot of little projects, and that we do most of those in-house, and that we follow um, the Texas purchasing and contracting guidance. And so the federal government has a threshold for what's called micro-purchasing, which allows you to purchase and contract um, under $10,000 without going through this formal bidding process. They also make an, an allowance that says that entities, non-federal entities, can increase that threshold to 50000 as long as they maintain consistency with their state laws. Okay, so what this resolution proposes to do is increase the federal micro-purchasing threshold from 10,000 to 50,000 because that is what the, law, the state law allows us to do very similarly. Now, we still go out for bid, but we get an informal bid and or um, we may go out for a bid for let's say water well services, and then we don't bid it out every time because we have a, a um, we vetted a contractor and that the preponderance of evidence says that you know, we, we are getting quality service and we're doing it um, the right way. We, we can document that and we, we've worked through that. So um, by doing this, this allows us to go to Bear County and say when we do these small projects, we have to itemize the reimbursables for man hours, which are authorized use, the equipment use and, and the hours de 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 you know, depreciated for the equipment use or what the cost would be, but also parts. So we go for those parts, we purchase the parts, we'll be able to purchase up to $50,000. Same thing like if you, if we have rock sawing that occurs across the road so we can have a three foot um, um, channel there and put our lines in, and we don't do that ourselves. We've been subcontracting that out with rock saw contractors. And so Brandon's got, for example, three quotes from rock saw companies, and we can take the lowest one, in which we've done, and we can go through that. This will simplify that, and essentially, th this will now allow us to go to Bear County with a new proposal set of projects. And um, the only thing else I would emphasize is this still requires us to follow the, the state's purchasing and contracting um, rules. Okay, and so specifically this is in, to enable us to use our interlocal agreement funds with um, Bear County concerning ARPA utilization for our public works department. For the federal funds, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's correct, Mayor. Okay. Okay, uh, do we have a motion to approve resolution R-2023-007 authorizing increase in micro-purchase threshold for purchases of goods and services using federal funding subject to the procurement standards of 2 CFR Part 200 Subpart D? So moved. So we have a motion that. from Pete, a second from Lee. Anybody want to talk about this? This, yeah. this is really riveting stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh, Pete, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here to... <laughs> 
to elucidate. So, Billy, every time I look at something, I always try to look at the pros and the cons of something. When I look at this, I don't see any cons. This seems real obvious that you would do it. But is are there any auditing strings attached to this? Are there any things that, that would make this burdensome to the city? And is there any counter argument why you wouldn't want to do this? That's a great question. Um, because we're getting federal funds, and there is a threshold for uh, the amount of federal funds you can get in a year before you trigger an audit or a possible audit. And if we we have some ARPA funds that we have budgeted this year and we are, are likely to budget next year, and then the combination of this will probably bring us above that threshold. Um, so this in itself won't trigger an audit. The use of the federal funds will. Now, because Bear County is a large entity with millions and millions of dollars, they're, they're audited and they have to do this. Whether or not they, they will then go down to our level, I don't know that question. This actual action itself, well, it, it, this in itself is not gonna open us up to a, an audit. This will, if we have an audit, will be able to more easily justify the purchases and the, and the process for how we did the purchases without doing formal bids from that standpoint. Um, the other yeah. thing this will do is we're going to enter into an interlocal agreement with Bear County says these are our 10 projects and this is the basic timeline we're going to do it some of which we've already have completed portions of it. We're going to have to turn in all the detailed accounting and receipts and everything to Bear County and trust me they will be looking at this with a very sharp micro microscope and if we request reimbursement for $85,000 on project A, they're gonna say, well, look, I don't think you've met the threshold for this and you haven't given me enough documentation. We're either gonna have to provide that or they're not gonna fund that portion of it. Um, from what I can understand, I'm not speaking for them, they may or may not have um, initially in the, in the COVID funding stuff, um, not had as much tight controls on it and so they they, in the process, they've learned. So this is, we're gonna have a lot of uh, checks and balances. Okay, thank you, Pete. Anybody else? Okay, um, we have a motion and a second on item 6.6, .6, motion to approve resolution R2023-007, authorizing increase in micro-purchasing threshold for purchases of goods and services using federal funding subject to the procurement standards and two CFR Part 200, subpart D. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries 5 0. Item 6.7, discussion action. Uh, deliberate the appointment of a municipal court of record alternate um, prosecutor subject to a possible. Executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551074 personnel matters. Bill? So, our ordinances um, say that we shall appoint a prosecutor and an alternate uh, prosecutor. To, about two years ago, we did that. At that point in time, we did not have the current law firm that we have with uh, Ditton of our Rocha, Bernard, and Zeck. We had the uh, law firm from up north of Austin. And as a result, um, uh, when we went out for a request for proposals or qualifications for the alternate prosecutor, we only got one um, application, and that was the Ryan Henry Law Firm, and they're a very capable law firm. Uh, we've actually used them on some other um, police items before, but uh, we haven't ever used them as the alternate prosecutor. And so Dan's team has a, uh, a team of three, two, two primary prosecutors and a paralegal, which specialize in this. And when you have comp uh, a little bit more complex cases that may have to go to the municipal court, um, someone that deals with the ordinances day to day is gonna be in a better position to prosecute th the case. And uh, in discussion with Daryl, which I had a discussion with him on that, he's actually encouraged us if those cases that we have are complex that deal more than um, deal more than just be, uh, uh, traffic violations and routine um, code compliance, that 
we ought to go with, and especially if that case could go to a civil court, you prosecute because the city prosecutor that we have designated isn't going to take it to a civil court or a city a law firm would be. So if you're, if you're going through the criminal court initially and then you hit to a road bump or something like that, it's not inconclusive. You can go civil court and t take action, and you're going to want that same team to actually um, pursue that in civil court. So this is what this is going to allow us to do, and, and, it, and it's actually uh, very much more efficient. We deal with Dan and his team all the time in drafting these ordinances, making sure we're following the law. When we get ready to enforce the law, having his team, who's already been part of that, partnered with us is going to be a lot more effective and efficient. Okay. Uh, Bill, a, a question uh, is, is this to become the alternate prosecutor or, a, or an alternate prosecutor? Are we saying, well, if Daryl's not available, when we have to do court night on Thursday, we're going to bring these guys all the way out here and we're going to pay them to do this, or are we going to continue to use our alternate prosecutor to do our traffic violations and all the little bitty things that are needed to take place in the city? Are you talking about a prosecutor, a, an, an alternate, or the alternate? Well, uh, the alternate is a similar law firm than what we curr I'm currently proposing that De Navarro, Rocha, Bernard, and Zek do. So if Daryl can't make it because he was incapacitated, we would have to go to a law firm. I'm saying we should just make that law firm the, our city's okay. no, law this firm. Is, uh, so I think it's question. the. Is it the? the. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll okay. probably bring this back up in May when we do it again. We'll, uh, we'll just renominate them again for that two-year period. We don't have a two-year requirement for a prosecutor like we do on judges. Yeah, we just seem, uh, we just we can do it follow in we want cycle to. with, with okay. them. Okay, uh, do we have a motion to approve Ben Navarro, Rocha, Bernal, and Zek as the Municipal Court of Record alternate prosecutor? So move. Maggie second. has made a motion. Pete has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion? Uh, there being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Pete? Okay. <laughs> all opposed, same sign. The motion carries 5 0. Brings us to item number seven. <clears throat> all matters listed under this item are considered routine by the City Council and will only be considered at the request of one or more aldermen. Coincident with each listed item, discussion will generally occur. Does anybody want to pull any of items 7.1 through 7.6? There being no request, brings us to item number eight. All matters listed under this item are considered routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will not be separate discussion of these items. This discussion is desired by any alderman on any item. That item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Do I have a motion to approve items 8.1? to approve and or accept items 8.1 through 8.9. So moved. Uh, we have a motion from Lee and a second from Maggie. There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries 5-0. This brings us to item nine, number nine. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion from Maggie to adjourn. Do we have a second? We have a second from Lee to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. We are adjourned.